Uh, yes, first of all, thanks a lot for welcoming me to this lecture. It's really nice to visit Norway sometimes. Feels a lot like home if you're Swedish. So I was told to talk about new classical architecture in Sweden, which is, in truth, quite a wide subject. And uh, before I do that, and thinking of where we are in the world, when I tried to book my airplane ticket to go here, again, I was shown this. So this is how Norwegian airlines make you choose where to go. And <laughs> to be honest, I would have loved to click any of the other pictures. But it says a lot about where we are and why we are here. So in my talk, I will touch upon these subjects. Classical architecture, question mark. What's going on in Sweden, question mark. What I do, some telling examples, and a cure. Question mark. So first of all, classical architecture. In our time, I feel that this word is very often referred to by people who don't know the meaning of it. So you're all educated people, I know this. So to most of you, this is just a reminder of something you heard in school. But to other people, it might be new. So in your head, look at this timeline. It starts with the pyramids of Giza. It ends in the future about the year 2100. Where was classical architecture? Where did we do classical architecture? When did we do classical architecture? Just think in your mind. I would say it's a dominant general architecture idea from 900 BC until quite recently. And that says a lot, because we haven't, as a species, been building that long, so this is most of the things we've been building since we started building. Therefore, it's very important to what we build today. The basis of all this is very often referred to the post and lintel system, what's being carried and what's carrying it. And uh, this is Eisen's etching from 1755 called the Vitruvian Hut, or the birth of architecture. And uh, since today, I might say that what he's trying to explain is fractals. Because fractals come from nature. Architecture comes from humans, and we are from nature. Therefore, this image of Pallas Athena, the goddess, explaining to the archangel Gabriel where a building came from, probably referring to these tree trunks put together almost like a temple gable. But it says a lot about where it's from. Also look at what he, she's holding in her hand and what she's resting her arm on. So, the major source of architecture and the history of architecture is Vitruvius, the ten books of architecture, Dicium Libre dell'Architectura. It was refound as a copy, lacking illustrations, in 1414. And this book is very often the only oldest and almost divine source of what we know about antiquity when it comes to architecture. So it's important to know what we learn from Vitruvius. So first of all, beauty derives from the harmony between parts. That's proportion. Leonardo da Vinci did an interpretation, which we all know, and the Vitruvian man was born. Vitruvius tells us, tells us firmitas utilitas venustas, or Firmness, commodity, and delight. What's sustainable, useful, and beautiful? The three major parts and the questions you have to ask yourself every time you're judging architecture. And finally, he teaches us the classical orders and the columns, the Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian. And happily, I can say to our delight, we're surrounded by them today here in this beautiful room. So classical architecture is not a style. It's more of a language, where the elements are letters, the orders is the grammar, and the composition is the sentence. And if you like this quote, it's by me. So you're free to use it. <laughs> so I'm not here to talk about classical architecture. I would have loved to, but I'm going to talk about what's going on in Sweden. And it might be a small thing, but I think we've stumbled upon something that's quite important. And I'm trying to tell you what, what it is and why it's important. So first of all, the architecture uprising. 
a small Facebook group of people that were annoyed about the ugliness of what's being built, and the schools didn't teach anything about how to produce beauty. I was myself a founding member, one of the first members in 2014. We're today about 65,000 members. We exist on social media and in real life. And today we exist in these countries, and it's growing. Today the strongest nation in activity and members is actually Norway. So what do we do then? What's the architecture uprising? We do things like this on social media. Which postcard will you send from Stockholm? Which one would you choose? Or would you like a castle or a box? It's the same price tag. And we refer to projects with the bug budgets. We've started doing things like the fake view of the year. When our members look at renderings, images that architectural firms sell to people who are supposed to buy apartments in them, how they think they're going to look on the left, and what people actually pay for, and then on the right, what's being built. And we have this award, a fake award almost, because it's not something you would gladly take, but we just tell and show that this is going on, fake, you, fake view of the year, every year. And we have competitions like, what's the ugliest building in your city? And what's the most beautiful one? Which of these boxes do you think represents which? <laughs> but what we do is nothing new. This is a clip from a newspaper and a comic strip, strip from 1930 that says, ah, so your son is working in a box factory. Yes, he's becoming an architect. <laughs> so what we do is nothing new. What's new is we brought this kind of debate to social media, and that gave power to people who normally didn't have power. We meet, we have protests, we do demonstrations, and mostly show people that we exist and we're a movement. This banner says, Stop Verfuhlingen, Stop the Uglification, the Architecture Uprising. This was just outside a new built art museum in Stockholm that looks like a nuclear power plant or something. So, talking about nuclear power plants, I think our greatest victory so far as a movement was the Nobel Center in Stockholm. And it's not Nobel because it's Nobel. It's named after Alfred Nobel, the person behind the Nobel Prize. So this was intended to be a new center for the Nobel Foundation, built in the most historic areas of Stockholm. And most of our members thought that this looks like a shipping container. It's really boring. So we did this postcard to Mr. Shipperfield, the architect, said, greetings from Stockholm. But the thing is, we don't want this. And most people don't want this. And it showed, which also meant the project was stopped and moved elsewhere. This gave a wave into politics. And this, I think, is the moment where people in politics realize that so many people in society like this. They think this is important. So the quote I remember the best is from the moderate party in central Stockholm, with the quote, this is something you could lose an election from. Not win, you could lose. And they says about, said something about the setting in Swedish politics when it comes to this. So since then, in Swedish elections, we can see things like this as people don't want modernist architecture, social democratic party. We want a safe and beautiful Stockholm, Sweden democratic party. No ugly high rises from the moderate party or classical buildings in our community. S a proposal from the center party. This is something new. This is something we've never seen before in a Swedish context. People in politics talk to their voters and they think this is something I can gain more voters from because this is a topic that's important to them. So it changed the landscape of political architecture. When it comes to opinion in Sweden, every time there's been a survey, every time people have been asked, every time someone did a survey in, in a university, it shows clearly the will of the people has spoken. The architects are wrong. 85% prefer classical architecture. If there was a free market, we would build in a classical style. The verdict of the people, no more boring boxes. And are we building what people really want? So clearly, in a Swedish context, everybody knows that most of the people, a crushing majority of people, wants traditional aesthetic architecture. But not only that, 
Sweden is a democracy, but it's also a mar market economy. People vote with their wallets. They vote with their feet. And they're ready to pay a lot more money for traditional architecture, for classical architecture. And it shows in every statistical survey, in every street, in every part of the country, in every city. It's as clear as this newspaper article. Get one extra room in the city for free by buying an apartment in a modernist building. <laughs> That's the difference in the price of modernism compared to traditional architecture. So we know then that people want this and they're ready to pay for it. So then, what do I do? I'm actually a practicing architect myself, so I thought before I go on to some telling examples, I'll just show you some things I like and I'm trying to contribute in this cause. So this is a building quite close to my hometown in Sundsvall. It's an industrial forest region, and this building is kind of a celebration to the forest industry. So we've been looking into timber shipping and paper making, together with Greek kind of traditional aesthetics in wood. So this is a gable pilaster, and it's a reference to a frieze, an architrave, maybe a cornice if you look to the roof line. Quite simple, quite industrial, but something I like. This is from a private house, also in wood. Just a reference to a temple gable, a small elegant little square pilaster marking the entrance of the house. This is a private house as well in my hometown. Quite small, but still very traditional. And it refers to traditional aesthetics, local aesthetics in a local material. So then, let's give you some telling examples. And these are not perfect, but it says a lot. These processes in society says a lot about where we're going and what's happening. So the first one is north of Stockholm in a municipality called Upplands Väsby. In 2019, the leading political party and their leader said, I want to ask the people in our city, what kind of architecture do they like? So they made a survey asking people. And it was quite clear. They loved Jugend style, neo-Renaissance, 1920s classicism, national romanticism, and what they didn't like was Million Program, which means the Million Program, which was the Social Democratic Party's way of solving the housing crisis in the 1960s, which is mostly brutalist, but 100% modernist. It's even so that the functionalist style, something the Swedish architecture community is proud of, ended up in second last. So, the politicians in the community said, next time we're building something, it has to be in some of these four styles. So, they had a great competition. This area is mostly modernist, but it's very central in this area. So they chose six proposals in a competition, and they let the people living there vote for which one's getting to build. Me, myself, and my firm, we did this to contribute. We didn't go to the finals, but it was our proposal of something that could have been made in this modernist suburb of Stockholm. This is from the Architectures magazine in Stockholm, saying architecture with a political explosive power. This was what it meant to the establishment of architects in Sweden. It was something of an explosion. So this is how it's supposed to look. These are the winning proposals, uh, street view and another street view. So in a few years, we'll see, but this is the plan. This was quite early in the process, and it made lots of media. And I think it's the first tap to get through the modernist wall. Second one is from Nacka, also close to Stockholm. A competition from 2017. Nacka is developing hugely with a new metro line, and all these purple, red, and black squares are supposed to be new buildings. The red one, numbered one, was supposed to be the first block built in this new city. You could see it. it in the black oval that there. So, this news article has the headline, most points, but didn't win. So this was the proposal the city officials in Nacka and the architects recommended to build. So, they thought this should be the winner. This is what we should build. This would be the best. But people in politics, they listened to the voters and said otherwise. We would like this. 
or this in daylight. And what happened was a victory of democracy and the will of the people. This is being built right now. It's completely different from what the city architects and officials recommended, but it's something in the style of the will of the people. Second one, it's in Gothenburg, Ekmansgatan, also competition from 2019. If you know Gothenburg, the main plaza is Götaplatsen, the most central place in all of Gothenburg, most beautiful as well. This plot is about 100 meters from there. It was an empty plot, left from planning in the 1910s, and the city decided to have a competition about what's going to be built here. A friend of mine, called Albert Svensson, did this. I think it was beautiful. But the city officials thought this was the best to do. So they said to the people in politics and the people in planning, this is what we should do. This was actually what most people in politics wanted, and also most of the residents. So the city officials still tried to stop this new development in a traditional style twice by sending it back to draw again and draw again just to get their own opinions through. And these people are not elected by the people. They're architects and officials. But in the end, democracy won. And this is being built. Quite beautiful in my eyes. And it really fits this place. It's called Lorenz Bay in Gothenburg, a very, very traditional neighborhood. And both in material, in scale, and in style, it fits the surroundings. This is an interior shot of this building, and also this one. So it might be so that to make architecture a matter of democracy could be a cure for modernism. I'm not saying it is, but there are signs showing it might be. And to end, I think maybe Leon Krier was right in 1988 when he did this sketch. So let's end on that note and hope for a better 2030. Thanks a lot.